Breaking new body camera video of yet another deadly police shooting. Tell me your ass. Stop it. Stop it. 13 year old boy raising his hands up when he was shot dead by a Chicago police officer. The mayor of Chicago tonight calling this video incredibly difficult to watch, saying, as a mom, this is not something you want your children to see. The investigation now underway into just what happened. Facing murder charges, former police officer Derek Chauvin pleads the fifth and will not testify. Tonight, the trial has moved to closing statements. The special instructions the judge delivered to the jury tonight and when we might see a verdict. In a different courtroom not far away, that former officer charged with second-degree manslaughter for shooting Dante Wright makes her first appearance. By some legal experts are already saying this could be a hard case for prosecutors. Tonight, dramatic new video of a toddler dangling over the border wall, then dropped by a smuggler into the arms of an adult. Border Patrol agents say this two-year-old could easily have been killed. Mounting frustration about the decision to pause the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. One in four vaccine sites shut down as a result. The state of Michigan particularly hard hit as those variants surge. Last week, she begged the federal government for more vaccines. Tonight, Governor Whitmer is standing by to join us. Some are calling it the shadow pandemic. I have been chased, I have been groped, I have been catcalled. Our in-depth report on the growing movement to stop the disturbing rise of violence against women. The secrets of the Smithsonian. One man's trash is another man's treasure. In this case, America's treasure found in the trash. Conversation with a barrier-breaking museum curator, what he thinks his place in history might be, and his fight to preserve America's hidden treasures. Bye. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Yet another disturbing video, this time of a 13-year-old little boy fatally shot in a split-second confrontation. This comes as protesters are still taking to the streets because of the shooting in Minnesota of Dante Wright. Both incidents have sparked renewed conversations about police use of force in this country and a collective feeling of here we go again. This image may soon become a rallying cry. You can see the teen appear to have his hands in the air, although it's unclear if he had anything in them. Officials say the officer was responding to reports of shots fired, then encountered a suspect who he chases through an alley. The officer later said the boy had a gun in his hand. Chicago's mayor is calling for calm tonight after the release of this video. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. You're about to witness a tragedy unfold in the blink of an eye. Just after 2 a.m. on March 29th, Chicago police respond to reports of shots fired. Chicago emergency, Travis. Hi, um, I just heard gunshots. But how many shots did you hear? A lot, more than five. An officer arrives at the scene, body camera rolling. He chases one of the two suspects, racing through an alley in hot pursuit, shoving a bystander aside during the chase. Then suddenly, a confrontation. The officer yelling to see the suspect's hands, the suspect stopping and turning quickly. The officer fires a shot. The officer begins CPR, but it's too late. When the confusion is over, we learn the suspect is only 13 years old. His name is Adam Toledo. The officer has said the boy had a gun in his hand. You can see a handgun a few feet away from the young man along this fence. But at the critical moment in some of the videos when the shot was fired, it's hard to see any gun in the boy's hands. An investigation's ongoing to determine what happened. Today, Chicago's mayor said it's all too much. A boy out in the city in the wee hours with an adult a handgun in the mix. An unwinnable situation with an almost predictable, terrible ending. In the middle of the night, this child was in contact with an adult who had a gun. There are a number of forces that met up at 2.30 in the morning on March 29th in an alley. And simply Some put, heart felt we failed at him. Mother, Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, so difficult to watch that video. Why do you think that the mayor and the family decided to release it, public, release it publicly? And what happens next in this case? Well, they clearly wanted transparency. They know it's an incredibly difficult situation. They also know that the city is watching. And what we were told is that the officer has been placed on administrative duties pending the investigation. And as for family members, their attorney released a joint statement with the mayor saying the release of the video is a first step toward healing, Lindsay, and they're calling for peace. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. 
in Minneapolis after 14 days in court. The trial of former officer Derek Chauvin is moving now to its final phase before both sides rested their case today. Chauvin pleaded the fifth, ruling out him testifying to the jury, speaking into a microphone before the jury entered the room. The former officer said it was his decision and his decision alone not to testify. We later learned from his attorney that there may have been an intense internal debate over whether he should take that stand or not. The trial will resume Monday with closing arguments. A verdict could soon follow shortly after that. Once again, our Alex Perez is in Minneapolis tonight. Former police officer Derek Chauvin today for the first time speaking in court, declaring he won't testify in his own defense, telling his lawyer and the judge he was invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. I have repeatedly advised you that this is your decision and your decision alone, right? Correct. And we have gone back and forth on the matter would be kind of an understatement, right? Yes, it is. Have you made a decision uh, today whether you intend to testify or whether you intend to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege? Uh, I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. Chauvin's lawyer then resting his case, but the prosecution wasn't finished. I was told in chambers that there was some newly discovered evidence that the state wished to present in rebuttal regarding carbon monoxide testing. Would you uh, tell me what that was? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we have blood gas evidence uh, from uh, Hennepin County that would have would contain blood gas readings for the carbon monoxide content in Mr. Floyd's uh, blood on May 25th of 2020. They called a rebuttal witness to challenge the new defense theory that George Floyd's death may have been caused in part by inhaling carbon monoxide from the tailpipe of the police vehicle. As to the statement that his carboxyhemoglobin could have increased by 10 to 18 percent, in your view, that's not possible. It's simply wrong. Dr. Martin Tobin, an expert on lung function and breathing, who previously testified for the prosecution, returning to the stand today, he told the jury carbon monoxide levels in Floyd's blood were normal. And it was at most 2%. At, at most 2%. Normal. Very, I mean, which is normal. That testimony potentially debunking the defense's theory. Alex Perez joins us now from Minneapolis. Alex, after court adjourned today, lawyers were called back to the court. What do you know about that? Yeah, Lindsay, the judge calling in both sides to discuss jury instructions. As you might imagine, each side has their certain particular things they want to make sure are included in those jury instructions. Uh, the judge is finalizing those instructions to present to both sides tomorrow. Now, the important part about those instructions is that they will really help both sides sort of build the parameters uh, around their closing arguments, which will be happening pretty soon, Lindsay. Yeah, and, and crystal ball it for us here. What's the timeline for a possible verdict? Well, you know, it's always dangerous when you're uh, playing with the crystal ball, but here's what we do know. On Monday, we expect closing arguments to begin Monday morning, so that means uh, the jury could be deliberating as early as a Monday afternoon. Uh, they will be sequestered when they are deliberating. The judge today telling them to pack a bag and to plan for long, but hope for short. So we should know sometime next week, Lindsay. Alex Perez, our thanks to you. And just a few blocks away from the Chauvin trial, a hearing was held for former police officer Kim Potter, who is charged with second-degree manslaughter in the death of Dante Wright. Wright's family watching it and demanding accountability. Stephanie Ramos joined the family during that emotional moment. Tonight, the parents of Dante Wright watching as the former police officer who allegedly mistook her gun for a taser killing their son appeared for her first court hearing. It's very hurtful to see she just sitting there. The news media not allowed to record the feed. Kim Potter now facing a single charge of second degree manslaughter, only responding yes to the judge's questions over Zoom. The Wright family describing their anguish. You just left the Zoom hearing for Officer Potter. Mm -hmm. How did that feel to see her? It hurt really bad. Um, I have hatred, anger, sadness. There's so many emotions. Potter, who resigned this week after 26 years on the Brooklyn Center Force, released from jail overnight after posting a $100,000 bond. The criminal complaint alleging that while trying to arrest Wright for an outstanding warrant after a traffic stop over the weekend, 
Potter fired her gun instead of deploying her taser, hitting the 20-year-old once. This isn't the first time a police officer has allegedly mistaken their gun for a taser. Since 2001, there have been at least 13 similar instances. Only two convictions resulted from those cases. The challenge for prosecutors here is going to be proving that she consciously took chances of causing death or great bodily harm. Consciously. Doesn't mean intended to do it. My brother and my sister need this woman to be convicted. If we can have life, we want life. We got to go life without him. The family making their idea of justice very clear. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, you've been in that community for several days now. What are you hearing as far as what they think is the next step for them? Well, Lindsay, what we've heard from people here on the ground, those protesters that are out in front of the Brooklyn Center Police Department day after day, they want a conviction. That's what justice looks like for them. Now, we spoke with the Wright family this afternoon, and they said there is no justice for them. They said they told us that their son will not be walking through the door, and what justice, uh, what they can get is a conviction of Officer Potter. They say that uh, is accountability, and that is what they're looking for. But what we saw today with Officer Potter uh, in her first court hearing, that fam the family says, the Wright family says, that is the first step in a very long legal journey, Lindsay. And when are we expecting Kim Potter to be back in court again? Officer Potter will be back in court next month. Right now, as you know, she is out on bond. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. And for some legal analysis, we now bring back Shauna Lloyd, civil rights attorney with the Cochran firm in Florida. Thanks so much for joining us again, Ms. Lloyd. And let's start with Kim Potter, that case and the shooting of Dante Wright. She's charged with second degree manslaughter. With what we know so far that she may have confused her gun with her taser, how hard do you think it'll be for prosecutors to get a conviction in this case and for her to get actual prison time for this incident? Um, in this case, as much as it, I don't think it's a popular opinion, the truth is by the law standard, I think it's going to be hard for them to get a conviction. I think what we may see is some form of a plea deal. If this was to go to trial, it's going to be a very high burden because the state has to choose, has to prove that she made a conscious choice. There is a defense of mistake. And if she honestly and reasonably believed that that was a taser, she doesn't have the requisite mens rea, which just means the mental state of having made a conscious choice for grave bodily harm. So the legal argument with that is going to be very hard to make, I believe, when you're looking at this case currently. Now, there's still a lot of facts that haven't come in, and there's going to be a lot of look into her history, um, her previous records, any incidents and uses of force that may shed some light on her state of mind when this took place. And let's now pivot to the Derek Chauvin trial in its final days. Were you surprised that Derek Chauvin invoked his Fifth Amendment right and decided not to testify? And, and what do you think the testifying could have gained and cost him? To be honest, Lindsay, I think that he was better off not having testified. I think it was smart because what he gained an advantage in was not being cross-examined. The cross-examination would have been very hard for him because he would have had to explain so many things and details that I don't think he would have had an explanation that would have sufficed for the jury. Now, what he, what he lost in that is that he couldn't humanize himself. He couldn't give an explanation as to if he had one as to what it was he was thinking when he made those choices and each step of the way. So he does lose that advantage with the jury. Now, the defense took a lot less time to argue its case than the prosecution. What does that tell us, if anything, about their respective arguments? I think that speaks more towards the burden of proof as opposed to their arguments. The state has a higher burden of proof. The defense does not actually have to put on a case. So this speaks to the fact that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this is their case in chief, that be, but for the knee on the neck, Mr. Floyd wouldn't have died. So that speaks to why their case was so much more extensive, because they don't want to leave room for reasonable doubt. And we also heard from some of Chauvin's colleagues, including his boss, the chief of police, but they testified for the state and not for him. How damning is that? 
I think that's incredibly damning for his case. I think that the juror is going to remember that all the testimony they heard. This is such a departure from anything we've seen typically in the past, where you have actual law enforcement officers that are stating that they felt this was unreasonable. These are people of his rank and above his rank that felt that this wasn't the appropriate use of force. That's a very big, big, significant fact that I do not think the jury is going to overlook. What are you expecting from closing arguments next week as the prosecution and the defense both try to, to seal it up for the jury? I think we're going to see the prosecution walk through everything that the defense brought up as a possible alternate cause of death. I think you're going to see them spend time on the witnesses. They're going to recall the summations and the definitive points that the experts made. You're going to see them tie that up in a nice little bundle so to leave with the jury so that way those are the points they're thinking about going into deliberation. I think we're going to see the defense go back and say, but this. And you heard this expert say that this is an alternate reason for the cause of death. You're going to see them highlight those areas where they best felt they made their argument for reasonable doubt. Shauna Lloyd, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And now to the humanitarian crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. New video shows the dangers and growing brazenness of human smugglers who continue to drop children over the border wall. Plus, many may remember the video from a few weeks ago of that young boy in tears, abandoned and wandering alone near the border. Matt Gutman has an update. Tonight, that jarring video, a two-year-old dangling over that 18-foot border wall and then dropped by a smuggler into the arms of an adult. Border Patrol releasing the video, noting the child was not injured, but could easily have been killed. It's the latest in a spate of videos showing children either dropped over that border wall or abandoned by smugglers in remote areas of the 2,000-mile U.S.-Mexico border. The mask of terror worn by this 10-year-old Nicaraguan boy in a video that has now gone viral describing the crisis of so many. The boy and his mother had crossed into the U.S. last month, but they were deported, his uncle telling Univision. That's when the uncle says both the boy and his mother were kidnapped and held for ransom. The uncle telling us he was able to come up with only half of the $10,000 ransom. The boy was released, but not his mother. Tonight, we learn she too is out, telling Univision she has spoken with her son and that her kidnappers told her it was no longer convenient for her to stay with them and they left her in an unfamiliar place. Such heartbreaking stories there. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, you also spoke with the boy's lawyer. What did she have to say? She said that in the next couple of days, she's very hopeful that the boy's mother will be allowed to cross into the U.S. to have her asylum claim heard. That would be the second time, right? So they tried it about a month ago, but now she actually has a leg to stand on because we know much more about her case, the allegations that she and her family have made, that she was abused by her husband and that going back would be a very dangerous situation. We also know that they have been trafficked along the border by kidnappers. Uh, she has since been released. So there's great hope that she could be crossing into the U.S. and could be reunited with her son, who we are hearing could be released into the custody of his uncle, that's her brother, uh, as early as tomorrow, Lindsay. So things are looking up for that one family. Lindsay. So glad to hear that update, Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Today, President Biden announced a forceful response to Russia imposing sweeping sanctions and expelling diplomats in response to cyber hacking and election interference and for allegedly offering bounties for attacks on U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Russia has summoned the U.S. ambassador to Mas Moscow and warned they will respond. Here's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. President Biden today announcing sweeping actions to punish Russia for interfering in the 2020 presidential election and hacking into multiple U.S. government agencies and major private companies like Microsoft. We'll always stand in defense of our country, our institutions, our people and our allies. The U.S. imposing sanctions on dozens of entities and individuals and expelling 10 Russian diplomats from Washington. Biden says the response is in kind, but is warning he could do more. We could have gone further, but I chose not to do so. To be, I chose to be proportionate. 
We want a stable, predictable relationship. The U.S. is also ratcheting up the pressure on Russia's continued occupation of Crimea and reports Russia offered bounties to militants in Afghanistan to kill American troops. Responding today, the Russian Foreign Ministry called the U.S.'s actions unacceptable and is promising a series of retaliatory measures will follow in the near future. Mayor Bruce joins us now from the White House. The president announced these actions, but at the same time, he's also reached out to Russia's leader, Vladimir Putin. He has, Lindsay, and he's invited the Russian president to meet with him face to face for a summit this summer in Europe. Tonight, discussions about that meeting are still ongoing, but it goes to this larger point that the president here is really trying to walk a bit of a fine line. He's trying to punish Russia for these actions while also trying to find ways that they can work together going forward. And Russia's election interference was certainly a huge part of the fights on Capitol Hill during the Trump administration. So, how are members of Congress reacting to? this action against Russia today. The president's actions are actually being welcomed on Capitol Hill by both sides of the aisle. Of course, this is a pretty sharp break from the kinds of actions that we saw President Trump take against Russia. But there are also questions about what comes next. Many lawmakers, both Republicans and Democrats, have said that this is a good first step. And the president today was asked if he's seen any indication that President Putin is actually willing to change his behavior. President Biden said he certainly is hopeful that they can work together going forward. But he also sent a bit of a warning to President Putin, saying if he is going to respond to these new sanctions, that he hopes that, that Putin does it proportionally, because, of course, President Biden is warning that the U.S. can do more here. And he is stressing that he does not want to see any kind of escalation in the U.S.-Russian relationship, Lindsay. Mary Bruce, thanks so much. Thank you. And when we come back, the battle against the elements as the search continues for a dozen crew members believed to be missing at sea somewhere in the Gulf. It's being called the shadow pandemic. Violence against women surging during the pandemic, our in-depth look at the crisis. And up next, with cases continuing to surge and the pause on Johnson & Johnson shots, we're joined by the governor of Michigan as that state battles a spike in COVID. What can be done to help them? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. A Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, <laughs> then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. Fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9 8 Central on ABC. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. With the surging pandemic, we often talk so much about a race against time, but this driver in Florida took things way too literally watches the driver plows through a drawbridge in the process of opening, breaking right through the gates. Police think they know who the driver is, but no arrests have been made at this point. 
One in four Americans have now been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but experts warn that we are not out of the woods just yet. A total of 894 people died due to COVID in the last 24 hours alone, and the crisis continues to worsen in Michigan, where one doctor describes the situation there as a runaway train. All of this is the future of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine remains unknown. ABC's Whit Johnson brings us the latest. Tonight, a growing emergency in Michigan. Beaumont Health System overwhelmed with 800 COVID patients at eight hospitals, now setting up outdoor triage centers to handle the surge. Where we currently are in our third surge, uh, which is just like a runaway train right now. 24 of Michigan's hospitals are at 90% capacity. The healthcare workers are tired, they're frustrated. They're, they're being told to do more with less. Across the country, COVID cases climbing 31% in the last month. And today, frustration boiling over on Capitol Hill. Dr. Fauci facing off with Congressman Jim Jordan. When do Americans get their freedom back? When we get the level of infection in this country low enough that it is not a really high threat. What is low enough? Give me a number. Dr. Fauci then saying this isn't about liberties. It's about the hundreds of thousands of lives lost. Right now we have about 60,000 infections a day, which is a very large risk for a surge. We're not talking about liberties. We're talking about a pandemic that has killed 560,000 Americans. The CEO of Pfizer saying Americans will likely need a booster, a third shot within 12 months of getting fully vaccinated, and that it's possible they will need to get vaccinated every year. This after a CDC advisory panel extended a pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to investigate rare blood clots in six women. The fallout swift. Some vaccination sites already seeing a dip in demand. It's pretty unfortunate because there's so much uh, fear about the vaccines already. Many of the 7,000 locations that were only offering Johnson & Johnson now scrambling to make other vaccines available. But the extended pause getting pushback from some health experts worried about vaccine confidence. If it comes to be that there are people who don't get a vaccine because they were only going to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or don't get vaccine COVID vaccines in general, then we've done harm. Then we have an exercise caution. Then in the name of caution, we've actually put people uh, in, in a riskier situation. Our thanks to Whit Johnson. While COVID cases and hospitalizations have been on the rise in recent weeks, no state, as we've been saying, has seen a worse spring surge than Michigan. The state's weekly report shows hospitalizations are up more than 25% since last week, and COVID-related deaths are up 39%. New COVID cases and hospitalizations are highest among younger adults under the age of 40. For more on this, we are joined now by the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. Thank you so much for joining us, Governor. Thank you. So this week, the CDC director urged you to shut things down in your state in order to get this surge under control. You've responded that the issue is lack of compliance with existing rules and the spread of variants. But have you considered that a temporary return to the same restrictions that worked in your state this time last year might help slow the spread and, and increase compliance? So this time last year, of course, we didn't know a lot about this virus. We didn't know that a mask could keep you safe. We didn't know if we would ever get testing just to ascertain whether or not we had COVID. We didn't know that vaccines would be here. A lot has changed in the last year. What else has changed is the fact that I have been sued by my Republican legislature and lost in a Republican-controlled Supreme Court some of the executive powers that I use to keep people safe. But I do think it's important to point out we still do have a lot of really strong protocols to keep people safe. Unlike other states in Michigan, we have a mask mandate. We have capacity of restrictions. We have work from home. We've encouraged people to take a two week pause. Don't go back to school after spring break. Stay home, do schooling virtually. Stay out of indoor dining and restaurants that are only at 50% as it is. But still, we know what the community spread that we're seeing, it's not safe to do a lot of these things. And we're encouraging people to, to have some personal responsibility here and to do their part. But even if another shutdown is not what citizens want, does your role as the head of the state make you ultimately responsible for what's in the state's best interest? And according to the CDC, a shutdown is what would be in the state's best interest. 
Well, as I said, I don't have the same set of powers that I had a year ago. Uh, it's very different on the ground here in Michigan than perhaps from the vantage point in Washington, D.C. What I will say, though, is that we know what it takes to stay safe. And it is incumbent on every single one of us to take this virus seriously and to do our part, masking up, avoiding indoor gatherings, and most critically, getting that vaccine. We now have over 42% of our population has had at least one shot, uh, almost 30%. We're getting close to 30% of our population being fully vaccinated. So we are in a race and that's why bringing more therapeutics online, uh, the Biden administration sending more boots on the ground, more mobile units and our use of um, monoclonal antibodies that we announced yesterday is gonna be really crucial to keeping people out of the hospital and saving lives. So it sounds to me like your hands are tied. Do you still have the power at this point to make certain mandates like, for example, closing indoor dining, for example? You know, I, I do have some uh, some powers. My Department of Health and Human Services does retain some powers to do some things. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to whether or not the citizens take this seriously and do their part. And that's really going to be the answer to getting us out of this moment. We're starting to see things look as though they're slowing down a bit. I don't want to, by any um, stretch, say that this isn't serious and that we don't all have to take this very seriously. But we're making progress, and it's really incumbent on everyone in the state to do their part, and everyone across the country, for that matter. I know you say that it, it, you feel that the, the trend lines are, are potentially slowing and maybe uh, positive, but what concerns you the most at this current point based on, on the current trends? Well, we still know that there are people that could get vaccinated today that haven't made their appointment. Um, the quicker we can get to over 70% of our population vaccinated, the quicker we can breathe a little easier and knowing that we are gonna get through this um, and have some more normalcy. That's the goal. And I know President Biden said by the 4th of July, that is our hope, that is our hope here in Michigan as well. We wanna, we wanna meet or exceed that expectation, but it is contingent on us getting vaccinated and we've got more and more availability, but we need the people of this state and across the country, frankly, to make those vaccination appointments and get inoculated. It's the best way to stay safe and to get our economy back on track. Beyond vaccines, what else would you like to see from the Biden administration as far as helping out the state of Michigan? Well, we're very grateful. We've got more boots on the ground coming. We've had regular daily conversations with the administration. Uh, therapeutics are, we, we've asked for more therapeutics. Those are, are on the way as well. So I would say that they have really stepped up and been a great partner to us and we're grateful for their leadership. We've seen concerns about vaccine hesitancy across the country and in Michigan is, is no different. Do you have a sense of why so few people are getting vaccinated in Detroit in particular? Well, you know, uh, we have got the TCF, which is being run by the city of Detroit. They're doing a great job getting vaccines into arms. We've got the Ford Field uh, Opportunity, which is a mass vaccination site with the federal government, FEMA, the National Guard. I mean, it's all hands on deck. We're really um, rolling on vaccines. But of course, we know that uh, we're starting to get to a point where we'll see supply outweigh demand. And that's why it's gonna be so important that we continue to urge people to get educated, and to uh, make use of this incredible opportunity to get an inoculation from a virus that has just ravaged our nation. And we understand that you had a conversation uh, over the phone with President Biden earlier this week. Anything that you're able to share uh, from that conversation that, that gives you hope about the future of Michigan and COVID? Well, I've got a lot of hope because of the Biden administration, frankly. Um, January 20th, we saw this administration start to get, you know, states vaccines, start to buy vaccines, uh, ensure that we've got visibility three weeks out so we can do our planning. Um, every week we've seen an increase in vaccines and so we're really grateful for the partnership. I know that President Biden cares a lot about Michigan. I know he's um, and his whole team are being great partners for us and this is a tough moment. We're gonna get through it, but we really do need all of us to take this seriously and to do our part. Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, we thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. Thank you.
Still ahead here on Prime, the incredible rescue. One man stranded at the top of a mountain with his cell phone battery about to die. He takes a photo. How rescuers were able to track him down because of that picture. What we're now learning about Prince Philip's funeral and if Harry and William will be walking in together as they have in traditionally in the past. And the study that finds support for Black Lives Matter has dropped during the Chauvin trial. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. NBA player LaMarcus Aldridge with a heartfelt threat about why he is leaving the NBA much sooner than he wished. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe we believe us? The reality is our country can collapse from within. Why you see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. As the trial of Derek Chauvin comes to an end and the case against Kim Potter for killing Dante Wright begins, we take a look at studies that show public support for the Black Lives Matter movement is actually dropping while public trust in law enforcement is rising. Here's the latest by the numbers. 69% of Americans say they trust local police and law enforcement to promote justice and equal treatment of all races, according to a USA Today Ipsos survey from March. That's up from 56% who felt that way last Last June. Meanwhile, just 37% of white Americans say that they support the Black Lives Matter movement, roughly the same share who supported the movement before the death of George Floyd, according to a civics poll. But it's down from the 43% of white Americans who supported the movement just after Floyd's death. Meanwhile, 85% of black Americans now say that they support Black Lives Matter, similar to the 88% who said that last year. While public opinion about police reform is generally all over the map, there is wide support for a federal ban on police chokeholds, an end to racial profiling, and mandating police-worn body cameras, according to 538. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Some congressional Democrats pushing to add four justices to the court after accusing the GOP of stealing seats. What the White House has to say about that. The deadly shootout allegedly involving a cartel and a well-loved teacher living a double life. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com.
guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We taught all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. The devil never. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Testimony is complete in the Derek Chauvin murder trial. Closing arguments are on Monday. For the first time, Derek Chauvin spoke out in the courtroom as he decided not to testify in his own murder trial. I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. Testimony wrapped up Thursday with a brief rebuttal by the prosecution over a theory presented by the defense yesterday that George Floyd may have been exposed to high levels of carbon monoxide during the encounter with police as he was on the ground near the tailpipe of the police car. The prosecution's medical expert testified that Floyd's blood blood oxygen levels were normal when he died. As to the statement that his carboxyhemoglobin could have increased by 10 to 18%, in your view, that's not possible. It's simply wrong. Judge Peter Cahill decided to recess for the day and take Friday off, allowing the attorneys to prepare over the long weekend for closing arguments, which will take place on Monday. Two congressmen from New York are leading the charge to expand the Supreme Court. Democrats Jerry Nadler and Mondaire Jones are co-sponsoring legislation to have 13 justices instead of the current nine. They say the change is necessary to wrest the court from Republican control. Our founders understood that as the country and the judicial system evolve, the court needs to evolve with it. And this legislation represents a much needed next step in that evolution. One decision at a time, the right wing majority on the Supreme Court has unraveled the greatest achievements of the civil rights movement. To produce a government that does not look like, understand, or even pretend to represent the American people. Last week, President Biden formed a commission to study the idea of expanding the size of the court. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says while she supports the study, she has no plans to bring the proposal to the House floor. Conditions remain hazardous off the coast of Louisiana as the Coast Guard continues to search for survivors of a capsized boat. One body has been found and six people rescued. The offshore platform ship called the Seacorp Power went down in hurricane force winds and high seas. And while conditions have not improved much, Coast Guard Captain Will Watson says, uh, You have to be hopeful. I'm in search and rescue mode. Two of the missing, Jacob Vara and Dylan Daspit, both fathers and best friends, working side by side on and off for a decade. They're not gonna leave one another. 
One is not going to come without the other. So far, the Coast Guard has searched 1,400 square miles. A popular North Carolina teacher killed in a shootout with a Mexican drug cartel. He was a well-loved Spanish teacher and basketball coach, but officials say 40-year-old Barney Harris was living a double life. Detectives say Harris and his brother-in-law, Stephen Stewart, were tracking members of the cartel to steal their drugs and money and got into a shootout with traffickers. A gun was found, bulletproof vest, gloves, etc. because, it, like I say, it looks like the, the trailers that were all shot up looks like a, a, a Western shootout. Now. Alamance County Sheriff Terry Johnson says they killed a cartel member who wouldn't say where the money was. They were close range, two bullet holes in the back of the head. He was executed. Harris was killed in a violent exchange after more gunmen arrived. Prince Philip's funeral officials say the Queen will travel to St. George's Chapel in her own vehicle. She and all of the guests will wear masks inside. Four singers will perform, and for safety reasons, they will not be near the royals. All of the music was chosen by Prince Philip himself. Prince Charles and Princess Anne will lead the procession following the casket. Prince William and his brother, Prince Harry, will also walk behind it, but they too will be kept apart per COVID protocols. Crowds gathered today to watch the King's Troop Royal Horse artillery rehearse and we are also getting our first look at the custom-built Land Rover hearse that will carry Prince Philip's body to his funeral. The Duke of Edinburgh began building the vehicle with Land Rover back in 2003. Welcome back. The shadow pandemic is the name the United Nations has given to the rise of violence against women over the past year. And while the abuse of women long predates COVID, this time women around the globe have taken to the streets and are raising their collective voices to say enough. ABC's Maggie Ruley brings us this report. For months, Margarita Grisheva went to physical therapy. If I have index, middle, ring, uh, little. <laughs> On a snowy day in December in 2017, her then husband drove her into the woods in Russia, where, enraged by her threats of divorce, he used an axe to chop off her hands. Doctors were able to reattach her left hand, although it has minimal use. But not her right. She's had to learn how to use a prosthetic. Margarita says when the violence started five years into marriage, she did what she was supposed to do. She went to the police. I went to an officer. I wrote a complaint, but our police officers didn't do anything. He said it's Russia. At least 155 countries have passed laws criminalizing domestic violence. Russia is an exception, even weakening protections in recent years. Margarita fought hard to successfully put her ex-husband behind bars for 14 years. But often, first-time offenders can walk away with a simple fine. The fact is, the punishment doesn't match the crime. How can a person do such a thing and just get three to five years? But even in countries that have domestic violence laws, like the U.S., US, cases are often hard to prosecute, and many incidents go unreported. Margarita's case may be horrific, but she's not alone. Roughly one-third of women worldwide have faced violent or sexual abuse in their lifetime. According to the UN, lockdowns from COVID-19 are compounding this violence. Victims trapped with their abusers and cut off from support. It's triggering what the UN has dubbed the shadow pandemic. <laughs> Over the past year, the unrelenting spread of violence against women has shaken the world. Calls to helplines increased in 80% of countries who provided information to the UN. No continent has been left untouched. A collective grief that's now fueling protests across the globe. In Mexico, women taking their anger to the streets. Australia facing a cultural reckoning over rape accusations in Parliament. I was raped inside Parliament House by a colleague, and for so long it felt like the people around me only cared because of where it happened and what it might mean to them. In London, the protest started with just one name, Sarah Everard, a young British woman brutally murdered as she was walking home from her friend's house early at night. When you first heard about what had happened, what did you think? Could it be me? Yeah. That's what I thought, and um, it was painful thinking of it because I walk every day. Her death sparking a social media movement, women sharing all the things they're taught to do to protect themselves from a young age. 
Do men realize women share their addresses? Once I had to hide in a bush for over an hour. Women have had to cross roads. Countless occasions I have felt unsafe. Men can never understand how frightening it can be. Text me when you get home. We've all walked by ourselves with, with friends, and I think it's important for everyone to understand that it's absolutely nothing that she did wrong. We put the, the focus on women and girls and what they should do, what they should wear, how they should walk, and how they need to, to protect themselves. I would say to men and boys that we all have a role to play. Activists taking back power, demanding that instead of blaming women, we change society. That's where Mandu Reed sees the chance to make a difference. It's not just women and girls. I think men are starting to appreciate that this isn't the world that they want to live in either. As the first black leader of a UK political party, WEP, or the Women's Equality Party, she's running to become the first woman to be mayor of London. They're fighting to have women's voices in places of power, leaders who know what it's like to be a woman in the world. I have been chased, I have been groped, I have been catcalled, I have had a man expose himself to me on the London Underground and masturbate on the London Underground. And my experience isn't exceptional, it doesn't stand out. It's fairly ordinary. What would that mean to have a woman in charge? Do you think that'll make a difference? Oh, I think it'll make a significant difference. Not how not, come? No, well, not so much just because of, um, you know, because of being a woman, but because she will bring to the table the issues that haven't been brought to the table before. And change, Mandu says, will be life-saving. Mandu believes global violence against women is at a tipping point. We've been together for about an hour now, and in that time, six women across the world have been murdered. That is the reality that we are facing across the globe, day in, day out. In January, Puerto Rico's governor declared a state of emergency over the spike in deaths related to gender violence. And the president of South Africa pledged $75 million in 2019 to help victims of gender-based violence. Yet the death toll has only gotten higher. Sehufatse Pule. Sarah Everard, Victoria Salazar, Sama El Haldi, Juan Jung Grant, and countless others. Every hour, the list keeps growing, and it can feel like this pandemic is only getting worse. Women have been fighting back for decades, but this year, as their voices rise across races, countries, and continents, is this time enough? Finally, enough. Do you think that that movement? is going to continue. What is revealed is that the appetite for change is there, 100%. But really, if we're going to see the type of change that will make a difference, that has to translate into political mm -hmm. momentum. And that is where our political leaders have a choice. They can either continue to turn a blind eye to it, or they can allocate the resources, show the leadership, and make the long-term commitments that would really shift the dial on this issue. And Lindsay, I wanted to share with you guys an update on Margarita. Our team filmed with her in Russia in 2018, and since then, she's become a TV host on a popular show in Russia where she raises awareness about domestic violence. She is still a fierce advocate and currently has a case pending in the European Court of Human Rights against those nine police officers who, she says, all ignored her complaints against her husband. And Lindsay, perhaps what is most joyful, we can tell you she's now moved to St. Petersburg with her children, where she has since remarried and is even expecting a baby. And we are all so thrilled she's doing so well. Lindsay. Thank you so much for that positive ending there, Maggie. We appreciate it. If you or anyone you know is suffering from domestic violence and needs help, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Take a look at this. It's like a scene out of a movie. A hiker goes missing. Thanks to a photo and a Good Samaritan, he was able to be brought to safety before it was too late. ABC's Will Reeve brings us this mountain miracle. This is the moment a hiker is lifted to safety nearly 24 hours after getting lost. And it's all thanks to this photo and the power of social media. I just help, help, and it just echoes in the mountains. Rene Campion was hiking in the Angeles National Forest when he got lost. Bears and mountain lions wandering nearby. So I was like, oh, I like, hope they don't come over here. So I just got a stick and some sharp rocks next to me where I was 
hiding just in case I need to like get away. Campion snapping this picture, sending it to a friend saying, SOS, my phone is going to die. I'm lost two to three miles away in the canyon, east of Buckhorn, I think. I was able to get like two bars and I took a picture and I sent it. And then my phone died after that. Police releasing the photo on social media, where luckily an avid hiker recognized the rocky location. I started going through the process of of looking at the photo, figuring out where it was. And I said, oh, I think I know where this guy is. And uh, found some GPS locations and uh, I gave it to the search and rescue guys. With the help of that tip, a helicopter making its way to the 45-year-old rescuing him. The man thankful for all who played a part in his rescue. Technology and the marvels of it are thanks to Will. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Boston marks eight years since the fatal bombings at the marathon with this repainted finish line. The line has become a Boston landmark. The marathon is usually held each year on April 15th, but this year it will happen on October 11th. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, stay on top of several things, including the final day of testimony in the Chauvin trial. Both sides now preparing for closing arguments. The new disturbing body camera video of a police involved shooting that is sparking outrage in Chicago and beyond. And the secrets of the Smithsonian shown by its newest leader. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. The devil never. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime. Cinematic. Real life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe? 
reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Frustration is mounting over the CDC panel's decision not to make a decision about the Johnson & Johnson pause. Health officials are investigating at least six reports of rare blood clots in women. That's out of 7 million shots administered. But the CDC also wants to see what, if anything, happens to the 3 million people who recently took the one-dose shots. One in four vaccine sites in the country are now shut down as cases continue continue to rise. And just a reminder, we are still losing about 700 lives a day to this virus. The video is hard to watch and it shows Chicago police fatally shooting 13 year old Adam Toledo. It all began after police received a call about gunfire on the city's southwest side. Chicago's mayor is now calling for peace. And just a block away from the courtroom where proceedings in the Chauvin trial are taking place, the officer who shot Dante Wright during a traffic stop appeared in court via Zoom. Kim Potter, the now former officer who served on the force for 26 years faces second degree manslaughter charge. Wright's family is calling for justice. More on that story is still ahead. But now to the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin. Both sides resting their cases today as Chauvin pleaded the fifth declining to testify. On Friday the trial moves to closing statements and a verdict could soon follow. Alex Perez reports. Former police officer Derek Chauvin today, for the first time, speaking in court, declaring he won't testify in his own defense, telling his lawyer and the judge he was invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. I have repeatedly advised you that this is your decision and your decision alone, right? Correct. We have gone back and forth on the matter would be kind of an understatement, right? Yes, it is. Have you made a decision uh, today whether you intend to testify? or whether you intend to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege. Uh, I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. Chauvin's lawyer then resting his case, but the prosecution wasn't finished. I was told in chambers that there was some newly discovered evidence that the state wished to present in rebuttal regarding carbon monoxide testing. Would you uh, tell me what that was? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we have blood gas evidence uh, from uh, Hennepin County that would have, would contain blood gas readings for the carbon monoxide content in Mr. Floyd's uh, blood on May 25th of 2020. They called a rebuttal witness to challenge the new defense theory that George Floyd's death may have been caused in part by inhaling carbon monoxide from the tailpipe of the police vehicle. As to the statement that his carboxyhemoglobin could have increased by 10 to 18 percent, in your view, that's not possible. It's simply wrong. Dr. Martin Tobin, an expert on lung function and breathing, who previously testified for the prosecution, returning to the stand today, he told the jury carbon monoxide levels in Floyd's blood were normal. And it was at most 2%. At, at most 2%. Normal. Very, I mean, which is normal. Our thanks to Alex for that and for more analysis on the trial. We bring in ABC News contributor and host of the Law and Crime Network, Mr. Brian Buckmeyer. Thanks again for your time, Brian. So Derek Chauvin invoked his Fifth Amendment right not to testify. What were the pros and cons of doing this? And do you think that he made the right choice? Yeah. So ultimately, I think Derek Chauvin made the right choice. In terms of pros, the pros for not testifying is that if Derek Chauvin did testify and slipped up in any way, talking about his truthfulness or his uh, tendency to be peaceful, the, def the prosecution, sorry, would be able to bring in other acts, potentially the fact that he's being charged with tax uh, charges, as well as his previous uh, uses of force of other individuals that may have brought him uh, civil or criminal liability. 
reliability. And so that would have opened the Pandora's box. In terms of Khan, the defense really needed someone. I think the only person who could really do it would be Derek Chauvin to get on the stand and say, this is what I was thinking. This is what I was distracted about. Yeah, I followed the rules of Chief Arredondo and I followed the outlines of Lieutenant Zimmerman and I used those um, tools at my disposal and I came to this conclusion and that was reasonable for me at that time. Everyone else is kind of Monday morning quarterbacking. That would have been the pro for him to testify, but I think weighing out those two factors, I think he made the right choice. And yesterday, the defense argued that carbon monoxide from the squad car may have contributed to George Floyd's death. How well would you say that the prosecution knocked that down today? Very well. This was a battle the defense didn't need to fight. They, they took a shotgun to a trial where they should have used a scalpel. And when you do that, the prosecution has the ability to bring in the star witness they absolutely wanted to bring in, that being Dr. Tobin, to artfully say that there was 98% of oxygen in George Floyd's body, meaning that there would be up to, not necessarily actually, but up to 2% of carbon monoxide. And Dr. Tobin artfully said, and looked around at the jury, that all of us have 0 to 3% of carbon monoxide in our body at any given time. So seeing 2% is not what the uh, Dr. Fowler saw in terms of 12 to 18, and he was wrong, which takes away from that doctor's credibility. A shotgun instead of a scalpel there. And just taking a step back, here's what Special Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell said in his opening statement on day one of this trial. We're going to show you that putting knees on somebody's neck, Mr. Floyd's, putting a knee on his back for nine minutes and 29 seconds was an imminently dangerous activity, and he did it without regard to what impact it had on Mr. Floyd's life. Now that the evidence phase is complete, what are your thoughts about how well the state made its case? So the state did a good job of kind of not really underselling, but selling just enough what they were going to be able to prove in this case. And they did do that. They put forth at least evidence on their case that was reasonable, it was logical, and it came from a credible source. And so the prosecution, at the very least, can come up in summation, which we'll see on Monday, and say, remember what we told you we'll do on opening statements? Well, we did it. We promised that. Here's the case. Go and find a conviction. And that's what you want to do when it comes to a summation. So you feel feel that the prosecution delivered. Let's hear as far as on the defense's side what was said on day one in their opening statement. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body, all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. Would you say that the defense provided enough evidence to support their theory in the case? No. And there are so many, thing wrong, so many things wrong with what Eric Nelson said there. And I think the best way I can do it is to, to show you uh, the better way of doing this. Eric Nelson should have got up on opening statements and not promised what the evidence would show, but reinforced that the burden is on the prosecution, that he doesn't have to prove anything. However, that he would be able to show that there's reasonable doubt by showing an alternative uh, explanation as to why George Floyd died. Now, that doesn't promise what he will do, but says that he He'll show just a monocle of information to catch you or the jury in terms of that position of being in reasonable doubt. But when he puts forward that statement that he's going to show this, he's taking on a burden that he doesn't need to take on, and he failed, at least in my mind, to do that. And so the jury's going to expect him to, to give them what he promised in opening statements. I don't think he can give that on summation. And Brian, if I can just go back to that statement, because it, it strikes me that what he didn't say led to the death was anything about carbon monoxide. And so do you feel that that maybe was just kind of a Hail Mary in the middle of the trial? Yeah, uh, Hail Mary, uh, and again, going back to, the, to my analogy, a shotgun approach instead of a scalpel, I think that as this trial went on, and we saw that not only in the carbon monoxide argument, but also in that video where we're saying, is George Floyd saying, I ate too many drugs, or I ain't do too many drugs? As this trial went on, Eric Nelson literally threw everything and the kitchen sink to see if it would work, and if some or most of those arguments don't work, his credibility decreases which each one of those arguments that doesn't seem to stick, and the jury may be left with even a strong argument by Eric Nelson, but because nine others were weak, they're not going to credit the one strong argument. 
Brian Buckmeyer, appreciate your time and insight. My pleasure. Closing arguments in the Chauvin trial set for Monday, but just a block from that courthouse, the now former officer who could face up to 10 years behind bars for fatally shooting Dante Wright appeared before a judge today. Rena Roy has more. ABC News exclusive video shows the family of 20-year-old Dante Wright watching former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter face a judge via Zoom for the first time. His loved ones huddled together in silence, hoping to see some accountability for their sudden loss. I have hatred, anger, sadness. There's so many emotions going through my whole body that I can't even explain it. Potter is charged with second-degree manslaughter for fatally shooting Wright and is out on bail after being booked at the Hennepin County Jail Wednesday. Body camera video shows what she claims was an accident, telling investigators she mistakenly fired her gun instead of her taser. When officers pulled Wright over on Sunday for an expired registration tag, they ran his name and discovered he had an outstanding misdemeanor warrant. As they tried to arrest him, Wright tried to get back in the car. Investigators say the mistake was avoidable. The criminal complaint states Potter's taser was on the left side of her duty belt and described it as yellow with a black grip. Protesters taking to the streets every night since the tragedy unfolded. This is a tough time that is undoubtedly filled with quite a bit of trauma. Uh, we recognize that and we want to express our solidarity with every resident throughout the city of Minneapolis. Our thanks to Rena Roy. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, Chicago's mayor called for calm after the release of the disturbing body camera footage that shows the death of a 13-year-old boy. Pierre Thomas has more. You're about to witness a tragedy unfold in the blink of an eye. Just after 2 a.m. on March 29th, Chicago police respond to reports of shots fired. Chicago emergency, Travis. Hi, um, I just heard gunshots. But how many shots did you hear? A lot of more than five. An officer arrives at the scene, body camera rolling. He chases one of the two suspects, racing through an alley in hot pursuit, shoving a bystander aside during the chase. Then suddenly, a confrontation. The officer yelling to see the suspect's hands, the suspect stopping and turning quickly. The officer fires a shot. The officer begins CPR, but it's too late. When the confusion is over, we learn the suspect is only 13 years old. His name is Adam Toledo. The officer has said the boy had a gun in his hand. You can see a handgun a few feet away from the young man along this fence. But at the critical moment in some of the videos when the shot was fired, it's hard to see any gun in the boy's hands. An investigation's ongoing to determine what happened. Today, Chicago's mayor said it's all too much. A boy out in the city in the wee hours with an adult a handgun in the mix. An unwinnable situation with an almost predictable, terrible ending. In the middle of the night, this child was in contact with an adult who had a gun. There are a number of forces that met up at 2.30 in the morning on March 29th in an alley. And simply put, we failed at him. Our thanks to Pierre for that. And next to the push by a select group of Democratic lawmakers who'd like to see the Biden administration expand the Supreme Court from nine justices to 13. But there is already opposition from within the party. Ike Ajachi has more. President Biden's executive order to study increasing the number of Supreme Court justices, as well as introducing potential term limits, calls for creating a 36-member bipartisan panel. Despite that process being now underway, Democrats such as House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler of New York and Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts introducing legislation expanding the nation's highest court from 9 to 13 justices, immediately letting President Biden fill the four empty seats. A response to how they feel Minority Leader Mitch McConnell manipulated the process, allowing Republicans to pack the Supreme Court. How can Americans look at the Supreme Court and expect it to do justice? It's doubtful the bill will become law. Democrats simply don't have the votes. And perhaps unsurprisingly, there was swift pushback from both sides of the aisle. Democrats in the Senate and the House have announced they will once again threaten judicial independence from the steps of the court. I have no plans to bring it to the floor, no. Even sitting Justice Stephen Breyer, the most senior member of the court's liberal wing, warning against any proposal to expand the court during a lecture at Harvard Law School. If the public sees judges as politicians in robes, its confidence in the courts and in the rule of law itself can only diminish. 
Two other justices, Sonia Sotomayor and Neil Gorsuch, speaking out against the notion that the high court is consumed with political partisanship, saying that while they may disagree with interpretations of the law, they never question the motive of justices on the other side of a ruling. Lindsay? Ike, thank you. And some positive news on the economic front. 576,000, that's the number of people who filed for unemployment benefits last week. Despite that number still being far too big, it is the lowest since the pandemic began. But to put it all into perspective, 16.9 million people are still collecting. Spending is also up. Retail sales were nearly 10% higher last month. Those stimulus checks and more people going out post-vaccinations is being credited for that rise. One of our ocean's most precious natural resources, coral reefs, are at a critical point due to warming temperatures. ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z brings us a deeper look into the efforts to preserve and save coral reefs. Sometimes called the rainforests of the sea, our magnificent coral reefs are home to nearly a quarter of the planet's fish. But across the globe, they are slowly dying off. Coral reefs are a thermometer that can measure the health of our planet. Temperatures are rising, coral reefs are declining. It may not seem like a lot, but in the past 20 years, oceans have warmed more than one degree Fahrenheit, and the impact is devastating. When a coral is stressed by increasing temperatures, um, they get very unhealthy, they lose their color, because they lose their algae and they bleach, they seem white. National Geographic explorers David Dubelay and Jennifer Hayes have been documenting coral reefs for decades. We could revisit these once healthy reefs, go right back to the same exact place with pictures in hand, carry them underwater, and do a side-by-side -side before and after climate change and impact. Jennifer and David returned to a site off Australia's Great Barrier Reef, where they had taken pictures nine years earlier. The differences? Stark. The balmy was a graveyard, a boneyard, an ossuary. It had died, it had bleached and died. The bleached coral, evidence of the effects of global climate change. And it really is the burden of proof. This is the truth about time in the sea. Organizations around the world are working to save the coral reef ecosystems. One operation, nestled in the Florida Keys, is called Moat Marine Laboratory, and they are attacking the problem in a unique way. It's called microfragmentation. We take a healthy coral of a certain species, and it can be any species, and we microfragment it, meaning we cut it into very, very small pieces the size of a single polyp or a couple of polyps. Those fragments then placed into tanks like this one, where the coral reef then have the opportunity to grow. What that does is stimulate the growth rate, so it grows 40, 50 times as fast, and we take those small fragments and then we replant them on dead coral heads. The fragments are drilled into the reef floor, where they help bring dead coral back to life. We can help stimulate the natural success of coral recruitment out in the wild and help to restore these coral reefs. Those efforts, creating hope for the future. It's right in front of you, and there is hope in the science, in the scientists, and there is hope in the next generation of stakeholders. Yeah. And Ginger has been telling us it's not too late for months in terms of stopping the effects of climate change. Next week on Earth Day, Ginger will bring us a special hour-long edition of It's Not Too Late. You can catch it at 8 p.m. next Thursday right here on ABC News Live. It will also be streaming on Hulu. And still ahead, the volcano crisis continues in St. Vincent. More on that coming up. And our conversation with the new leader of the Smithsonian Museums and some of the areas many have not seen until now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Take a look at this river of mud and ash in St. Vincent. The UN says this catastrophe could last for months and that nearby islands like Barbados and Antigua could also be adversely affected. They are appealing to the international community for help. In Brazil, Doctors Without Borders says Brazil does not have an effective pandemic plan and that because the country has not adopted science-based measures, it's teetering on a humanitarian catastrophe. They say disinformation is also fueling sickness and death there. They are calling on Brazilian leaders to first acknowledge the severity of the crisis. Buckingham Palace has released new details about Prince Philip's funeral, including that the Queen will be wearing a mask the entire time. Prince William and Harry will also not be walking next to each other during the procession. And a reminder, ABC News Live will have coverage of the event beginning at 9.30 a.m. Saturday. So often we hear about the importance of knowing our past to understand our present, but how about the importance of getting to know the people who collect that history? ABC's Kira Phillips sat down with the first ever African-American secretary of the Smithsonian Institution to discuss this past year in history and the role he and the institution play. Let us use history to inspire us to push a country forward, to help us believe that all things are possible. From his prestigious perch within the storied Smithsonian Castle, you're listening to a promise Dr. Lonnie Bunch made to himself at the age of 10. When you were a little boy and you wanted to visit museums, your dad would only drop you off in front of the Smithsonian. Why? He pulled into Washington, stopped in front of the Smithsonian, and said, here is a place where you can understand yourself, your history, and not have to worry about the burden of the color of your skin. So it is unbelievably humbling to be a part of it. Um, and it's a tad frightening to be in charge of it. In charge of the world's largest network of museums, 19 of them, plus 21 libraries and the National Zoo. Bunch is also the Smithsonian's first African-American secretary. The death of George Floyd Black Lives Matter, the protests, the insurrection. Do you feel added pressure because you are an African American and you have this duty to portray history at the highest level? Well, to be honest, as a black man, I've always had the pressure, regardless of what job I was in. So what I think, as an African American, What's really been the key to my sort of understanding myself in history is how does a country find fairness? 
How does a country make sure that freedom really rings for everybody? The Smithsonian doesn't have a political agenda. Our goal is to make a country better. And to find hope through history. Welcome to the bowels of the basement in the National Museum of American History. They're cataloged, they're photographed, if they're fragile, they're mended. For the first time, you're getting an exclusive look at how our past year of a pandemic and racial reckoning will be remembered here in the Smithsonian forever. That's the very first Pfizer vaccine. The first Pfizer vaccine given in the United States. This is an unprecedented sneak peek into history preserved, not just for us. Because they felt so passionately about a cause. But also this museum's first female director, Dr. Anthea Hartig. We have to collect to remember. Reminding us all that our future lies in preserving the past. Am I next? Thanks to curators who secure these collections. Everything we see here, it was empty. Frank Blazich is with the Smithsonian's uh, rapid response teams. Collectors dispatched during historical crises. Like this infamous day in our nation's capital. There was trash kind of scattered everywhere, but Frank took us back to where he saved those signs you just saw now archived within the Smithsonian. Since I thankfully had a multi tool in my vehicle and was able to break the rivet off, and I had to kick the sign physically free of the post to take it back into the Smithsonian for our collection. And where he tore through the trash after the Capitol Hill insurrection. I found two American flags. I found a file folder of copies of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, an abolitionist song composed not more than a mile from here. And I even found a small uh, personal defense hand whip or hand baton that had been buried down in the bottom of a trash can. One man's trash is another man's treasure. In this case, America's treasure found in the trash. Collecting today for tomorrow. How do you want to see the Smithsonian make an impact on social justice? The question really is, is it a moment where we take advantage of where we are? Is it a moment where, um, you know, in the midst of the trial around the murder of George Floyd, do we say, what kind of country do we want to be? What does fairness really mean in the 21st century? As many people have said, it's a struggle for the soul of America. A struggle, Secretary Bunch says, will be protected and preserved. I come out of a community that said, you will stand on the shoulders of others and you will open the door for others and you will be better. So what I want is the country to believe that, is to recognize that when America comes together, it's amazing what we can accomplish. While living up to that promise he made to himself decades ago. And to demand a country live up to its stated ideals. Our thanks to Kira for that. And now to a sign that we may be getting a bit closer to normalcy. Listen to that. Last night, for the first time in more than a year, the New York Philharmonic held their very first live performance in a concert hall in front of an audience of about 150 people. Music to our ears. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.